everyone and welcome to the Master Secrets. The summit is about information and inspiration to help you transform your own work and I'm your host Catherine Lloyd. Today we're here with master artist and visionary Barry John Rabel. Barry is the founder, creator, and resident artist at the virtualartacademy.com. Welcome Barry. Hi Catherine. How are you? Good, it's nice to be here. It's wonderful to have you here. Your, your website, uh, the Virtual Art Academy, is just one of the most incredible that I have ever seen, whether it's on the internet or not. And I'd really like you to share with us what your inspiration for beginning the Virtual Academy is. Okay. Um, well, it all started off in a, a workshop in uh, California. I used to live in uh, Pacific Grove on the coast there. And a couple of students were asking me, why don't you write a book? And so I thought about it a bit after the workshop and uh, started writing and carried on writing and kept on writing. And by the time I'd finished, I ended up with about 10 or 20 books instead of one book. Oh my. So I had far too much information that any one publisher could publish in a book because usually they, they limit it to about 175 pages with mostly pictures and not much text. So I thought, well, a friend of mine was a computer expert, and he said, why don't you publish it yourself, you know? There's a lot of tools around that you can do that. So that's how the, the, the Virtual Art Academy started off, was me publishing this library of books. Um, that was in 2004, I think, I released the first set. And uh, then it sort of took off from there. I started selling all over the world. And, then I thought, well, let's try something new and try to create an alternative to a university. And uh, that's how the, the latest incarnation of the Virtual Art Academy actually got started. It was the idea to turn that library of books into something of a structured course, if you like. And what, uh, what is your pattern for your course? Um, you know, the, the French academies of... Uh, the 19th century, or uh, have you expanded on that and uh, given us something completely different? Um, I guess there's a couple of answers to that. One is, in terms of the content, um, what I do like about those old academies is they took a very structured approach. So they, they started you with the basics. You just worked in basically black and white on drawings, usually from you know, geometrical blocks for several months, in fact. Then when you've done that, then they progress you to doing shading and more complex objects. Um, eventually, you got to doing rounder objects and figures. And then after the first year, you went to doing colour. So it was a very, very structured approach. And a lot of our foundation is quite important. So I included all of that in. But um, I also included a lot of things I learned about design, things that people started teaching in the 20th century. Uh, related to abstract design, and that is coloured um, harmonies, um, concepts of design and shape design, and, and things like note which was a fairly new, you know was a fairly new topic to people until quite recently. Although it used to be taught in the academies a long time ago. Well, I was introduced to Notan actually through you, uh, through another artist that led me to you. And I was just so interested in that concept and the way that it helped my art. Can you just share with us a little bit more information about Notan? Yeah, sure. Um, Notan is really the harmony between light and dark. And... Um, any good painting has got a foundation of this light, dark harmony. Um, if you take all the color out of a, of a painting, for example, and just look at it in black and white, you'll see this harmony. And there's several design principles to, to take account. First of all, you want to reduce the number of values to no more than uh, five values, and often only just two or three. Um, in fact, a lot of the strongest paintings have only got two or three major values. Um, another design concept is you need to have a dominant value. And what that means is that one of those values needs to be occupied more than, more than half of the, the surface area of the painting. Um, other principles are uh, something called flattening the values, which is where, although you might have more than five values, you, you, 
reduce them down into a small number of bands. So you put two values very close together um, in a light value, maybe two together in a middle value, and a couple in a, a dark value. And, and this way it simplifies the painting. Um, I think what, what painting is really about is simplifying what's out there. It's not capturing all the details. Um, really good paintings simplify nature. They don't capture it all. And I think that's a thing that a lot of painters miss. One of the things that I love about your work is that you're drawn in and there is so much to see inside your paintings. Um, the subtleties that are there are just incredible and your brush strokes and your colors are just so vibrant. I love your work. Thanks. Absolutely. So your program... Um, has a way for artists to be able to interact with each other. And can you can you tell us why that's important for artists um, to uh, to have a relationship with each other? Well, in a um, if you if you're doing a self study course, um, you don't have an instructor um, because having an instructor would be obviously quite expensive. But, so if you don't have an instructor, how do you get some feedback on, on what you're doing? Um, well, that's quite difficult if you're just working on your own. So the idea is that students actually upload their assignments and that the whole program is structured into a series of, is in fact, over 300 individual assignments, each of which practices a certain skill. And students upload them and then they make comments on other students. Plus you get to see the way other students approach it. So you might see, for example, somebody seems to have interpreted Notan in this particular way, and you thought, all right, well, I never thought about that. And, and it opens up a whole new way of thinking for, for you when you see what other people have done. So I, I've got people out in the middle of the, uh, the, the bush in South Africa, working with people in the desert in North Africa, talking to people in Los Angeles in California, and they're all having this dialogue together and sharing their paintings. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. I, I just love to go in there and watch what people are doing quite often. And in fact, it, it even inspires me to go out and do some of the, uh, the assignments. Um, oh, well, that's what I was just going to say is that the inspiration is for you as well, right? Yeah. In fact, you know, I got embarrassed. Some of the students were doing some things better than I could do. So I, I went and started doing the assignments myself. <laughs> No, I, there's a real reason for that. I once studied um, one of Sargent's paintings in the National Portrait Gallery, and I thought, well, I'll do a little drawing of this uh, head, it was, because it was so simple. And I thought it'll take me about 10 minutes to, to copy this head. Well, half an hour later, I was nowhere near copying this tiny little head because it just didn't look right. After an hour, suddenly it popped. And what I realized was that there was nothing complicated about this head. There were no development of the features or anything. It was just a shape with a hard edge for the profile where the front of the face was and a soft edge at the back. But in order for it to work, it had to be incredibly accurate. The profile had to be just perfect and the edges had to be just right. Mm -hmm. And that drove something home to me that the really great artists like Sargent, it wasn't that they knew more. It's just that they did these basic things better. And so that taught me a lesson. It said, okay, don't constantly keep on going and, and learning more and more, but keep on going back to those basic things that you think you already know, because that's how you get really good, is by doing the basics better. And Fundamental. A lot of artists don't do that. They don't think that. Particularly professional artists don't think to do that. Um, so I'm now constantly going back to the basics and just re-practicing. So I just don't think you can get enough enough practice in that area. And about how much time do you spend a week painting? It, it varies. Sometimes I have solid sessions where I'm just painting all week and then other weeks I'll do a couple of hours a day because I'm involved in other things. Um, the, the last few years I've spent a lot of time building the new Virtual Art Academy course. So I've not had, I've had less time painting. So luckily, the paintings, when I've gone out painting, my paintings seem to have actually improved a lot. I couldn't quite figure out why, but it may have something to do with the fact that I'm reading what I've 
telling students to do. <laughs> <laughs> because it really, when you write something, you really have to understand it. It makes you think about it, even if it's subconscious. Wonderful. So I've certainly been concentrating a lot more on um, shape design and, and value structures now. So what is it that your your students in the Virtual Art Academy, what is it that, that, that they can anticipate learning um, from your structure? How is it structured so that they're going to be gaining as much information as they possibly can? And are you constantly taking them back to the fundamentals to make sure that uh, they have a grasp of what is... Um, the, the foundation. Yeah. Um, the, the way it's structured is there are 16 workshops. Um, and each workshop is about the equivalent of what you would, the amount of information you would get if you went on a workshop with a, a professional painter for a week. So there's 16 sequential workshops. And what I suggest is people do one of these each, each quarter on average. And, and that systematically builds up your knowledge from uh, the basics of values and colour through composition, drawing, um, onto brushwork and more complicated aspects of composition. Um, so that takes you all the way through. But I always suggest to people that they go back and continue to do some of the early exercises on, on a constant basis so that you continually get better at, at those fundamentals. So it's a linear process, but on the other hand, you can go back and redo some of the earlier exercises just to keep on improving. Um, so that's basically the way it's structured. Um, the way it's broken down is um, into two key, two key areas. I've talked about visual music and poetry quite a lot. Um, I don't know if you've heard about those, those ideas, but the, the, the whole course is broken down into building blocks some of which address the, the poetry side of the painting, other, others address the musical side of the painting. Can you talk to us a little so, bit about that? Yeah, yeah the, um, the musical side of the painting is really the, the abstract uh, aspect to a painting. It's basically the, the, the colour design, the harmonies between the colours, uh, the arrangement of shapes and values. Um, and it's what a painting looks like if you look at it from when you first come into a room when you see a painting across the room. That's what you see. You see the abstract design. You don't see what the subject is. Um, if, you, if you turn the painting upside down, you react to the abstract design. It's just a pattern of shapes and colours. And to do that, you have to understand Noten, we've already talked about. Um, you have to understand colour harmonies. You have to understand shape design. Um, you have to understand how to design a, a painting in terms of values and a lot of compositional ideas such as contrast. Uh, how to contrast warm and cool colours. How do you contrast light and dark? Um, big shapes and small shapes. A painting is basically just a series of contrasts. So those things all relate to the abstract side of a painting. Uh, a lot of that knowledge came about during the 20th century with you know, the rise of abstract art. So that's the one aspect of the painting that I call the music side. Uh, the poet side, or the poetry side, is something entirely different. That's due to what the painting means. It's what the painting says to the viewer. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking there in terms of the emotion that it communicates. Uh, for example, I used to paint a lot on the Big Sur coastline, which is an incredible coastline in California where you've got these cliffs sort of falling down into the ocean. And it's a really emotional place, particularly when you've got a really big uh, stormy sea out there. There's tons of energy. And so in, in the painting of that, when you've got a high sea and tons of surf everywhere, you want to communicate that excitement to the, to the viewer. And, and that's what comes across in the painting. It's that emotion. If, if you're painting a, a portrait, for example, of a person, then you want to capture the feeling of that person, you know, whether it's a quiet, contemplative person, whether there's a particular serenity to the person, um, a character, a particular character that wants to come through. And so that's really what you're trying to say in, in a painting. It's the emotion, the story, if you like. And that requires understanding how to make things look real, basically. So you have to learn accurate drawing. 
Um, you've got to learn four how to make things look three dimensional. And you have to learn how to capture color relationships and value relationships. So, in a, um, for example, if you've got a landscape, you want to communicate a depth to it to make it feel like it's going into the distance. And one of the key things there is you've got to be able to really accurately match the colors that you see in nature. And it's not just the hue, whether it's red, yellow, blue. You have to map, um, accurately capture how light or dark it is. And also the saturation, which is how grey it is. Um, a lot of students don't get that. They don't really differentiate between high, low and middle saturation in the painting. And uh, those things are really key to making it look real. And if you can't make it look real, you can't get the emotion or the feeling of a place in the painting. So all that relates to the, uh, the poetry of the painting. So to me, a painting has to have both this abstract side, which I call the music, and then the poetry, which is the the feeling. If you get both of those, then great. <laughs> You've got it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not so easy to do. But that's really what I think artists should strive for, is capturing a little bit of both those two things. Yeah, well, painting is such a huge subject, and contained within that subject is an even huger subject, which I think is color. Do you find that students have um, a challenge with with color and interpreting it and its relationship to other colors and in a composition. Well, yeah, no, every every student first says, you know, I want to learn color. Yes, and <laughs> that's the first thing they want to do. How do you create those beautiful color harmonies? Yeah, and so I, I start them off with uh, black and white paints, and they look at me like I'm crazy, <laughs> uh, and it's because. One of the key things in, in accurately matching colour is you've really got to understand values. And so many students really think they understand it, but they don't. So you actually got to, the first thing I always do is get them to do a whole ton of value exercises, and you can very quickly see whether they understand it. If they don't, then there's no way they'll ever get any colour harmony in their painting. So what you have to do is you have to set them a set of assignments that help them learn values. And it, and it can take um, several months, you know, it's not something you can just learn in a, a few days or a week. You've really got to practice it. Yes. So that's the first thing, is uh, making sure that you're really good at values. And then the next thing is um, learning how to really see the, the hue, saturation of all the colours you see in nature. And there's really a process for doing that, and it's, it's based on colour studies and something called block studies where you study coloured blocks under sunlight. Um, there's a whole sequence of exercises you can use to teach yourself colour. And again, it's, it's not a thing that you can get results in a few days. It takes weeks, if not probably months, of practice. But if you do the practice, I, I've seen students do some fantastic things. Uh, it's just a question of following a, a structured sequence of learning, if you like. I read the post on your yeah. website about the block training, and I thought that was so interesting. The, um, very simple, but I had not ever heard it before. And I think that that's a, I, I think that's a nugget of gold that can really help people um, understand color much better. Yeah, it's it's, it's really interesting. The a lot of people, you read in a lot of books about light and shade and formulas for getting the, the shadow. Yes. Uh, the, the problem is they're all wrong. <laughs> they're all <laughs> actually a very rough approximate, uh, approximation. And in fact, there's only one book that I found that actually is fairly accurate on explaining it. And there's an interesting story behind that. I was once doing a workshop in the middle of winter in Maryland. And uh, in the long, cold evenings, I used to go to the, the library, the art library of the, uh, the man I was studying with, and just search through all of his books looking for nuggets. And I found this spiral bound book written years and years ago that never actually got published, but somehow he got a copy on it. And it was incredibly complicated to read. But I started going through it every night. It took me a week to get through it. And then on one of the pages, I discovered this fascinating thing about. What happens to colour when it hits a block in the light and the shade? And he had all these diagrams that explained what was going on, and all of a sudden it was a aha moment for me that 
This explained much better what actually happens to color in terms of the hue changes and the saturation changes. So um, that was a, a mind blower for me. And, and I started looking at that and thinking about it a lot. And it really explained what's going on in these box studies. It's not a formula to use, but it's an aid to understand it. There you go. So it's actually yeah. very interesting. I, I like that. It, it took me about two weeks to simplify it in a way that other people could understand it. I eventually put it into one of the units on form in the course notes. But uh, it, it was quite difficult to get it into a simplified form. But it really, it really helps you learn. So I, I've seen people now go through the, these block studies and I tell them, okay, you've got to do a hundred of them um, in the light and also later on do another hundred in, the, in, in an overcast condition. So I've seen people upload these onto the online campus. And to start with, they're quite crude, but it's just amazing. After number 50, they start to get quite good. Wonderful. Um, and, and really up to the quality of uh, you know, professional artists. In fact, better. But a lot of professional artists actually don't get these relationships right in their paintings. So it's, it's, it's kind of nice to see that it's not difficult. It really isn't. It's just a question of putting in the effort, actually. Color was is one of the uh, challenges in painting, and really being able to grasp it and understand it. Um, the block just made so much sense to me. What is it that sets you apart? Um, what other sort of academies are we are you talking about? Like university type academies? Yes, uh, brick and mortar. You know, uh, how is it, how is the virtual Art Academy different than, um, say, uh, one of the, the the schools that are out there? Um, order school. Yeah, uh, yeah, like um, an art university or an academy. Yes. Well, if you compare it to that, I think um, I think I take a probably a more structured approach in that I really go through all of the material. Um, taking you know, the material that they used to teach in the art academies probably up until the early 1900s. So I've included all that information, plus a lot of the later information on, on design. So it's really quite structured. I, I've looked at a few of the, the courses in universities. A lot of them are really very much based on only abstract art and, and actually conceptual art, some of them. And they really don't give students much of a foundation at all. I, I've had people some young students come on my workshops and they said they'd, they'd been studying at university and they just not learn anything. It appears the instructors didn't teach them anything. So there's quite a lot of universities like that where they're focusing on conceptual art and not, they're just not teaching the basics anymore. Um, there are some other courses that do teach the basics. Um, often they tend to be classical realism schools. Um, which is very good. It was the sort of painting that was done up till the end of the uh, 20th, 19th century. Um, it's very classical, very modelled, but they're not very, to me, it's not very exciting painting because it, it doesn't use, it's not a lot of abstract design, it's not a lot of brushwork, it's all very fine blended, very tight work. It, it can be beautiful, but it's not all that exciting. So I've tended to include a lot of things that are a bit more contemporary in the, in the course, but... Um, talk about expressive brushwork and the abstract design of the painting, the, the musical side, if you like. So that's probably a difference to those, the difference between the course I put together and a, a classical realism school, for example. Mm -hmm. And of course, the major difference is that you can do it at your, own, at your own home and in your own schedule. You don't have to spend a, a whole year going to a physical brick and mortar location. Uh, you can take as long as you want to do it and you, can, you don't have to travel. And that's probably the, that's one of the big differences. You have a, an incredible program that can really help an artist realize their dreams. Yeah, it is. It is quite expensive taking workshops because that the, the way I learned personally was I, I started finding the artist I like the best, and I would go on a workshop for a week, and uh, sometimes I would just come away with. The artist telling me my painting was no good, I need to go and do my <laughs> color studies. <laughs> That's what I would get in a week. Then I go back another year later for another session. But usually the workshops cost about seven or eight hundred dollars plus the travel, 
So it was about $1,500 a, a pop. And I, I guess I've done, I've done quite a lot of those, including several in China. So I reckon I've spent maybe up to about 30000 on my own art education over about five or six years. Um, it's quite a lot of money. But I, I started getting frustrating because, frustrated because often they were just repeating the same thing. And I, I, I left with not a lot of new information. And also I didn't have any reading materials to go back to. I had to try to make notes while people were talking, and that's difficult when you're trying to concentrate on what they're doing and write at the same time. So I ended up looking at my notes, and it was really quite difficult. So after a while, I ended up spending a lot of money and got quite frustrated that I wasn't getting an awful lot out of it. Um, also, it just took me so long to find the artists that um, I thought I could get information. Sometimes it was well-known artists, sometimes it was just a, a course that somebody recommended here and there that was just a weekend course. So it, it took me about 10 years to put together my own art education. Um, and I wish I could have done it much quicker, you know, in about two or three years. It would have been nice to have found everything, but it took me about 10 years at least to, to dig out. Um, well, you really have created an incredible resource yes. for people who are interested yes. in learning more about art, improving their own skills. Well, it, it, it's interesting because sometimes I see... Um, I see students in the early days of the paintings aren't particularly um, interesting, you know, they've got the usual sort of problems that, that students have. And then sometimes I, I, I look in and I see, my gosh, the student's doing some stuff that's making me sit up and wonder what's going on here. There was, um, there's, a, there's a man in Israel who was, doing, was going out and painting at night and doing these absolutely incredible nocturnes, just very, very loose and expressive of, uh, the city at night time and I just love the paintings and so um, it got me really interested in going out and doing some nocturnes myself so last uh, last August I was in Beijing because I, I do several trips to uh, to China and usually a couple of one or two each year and uh, I thought well I'll go out and paint the street vendors at night out in the, out in the streets so um, I was kind of inspired to go and do these nocturne painting, and it's just great painting at night because uh, the light just simplifies everything. You know, it's so interesting to be out there. You don't have to worry about changing, changing sunlight, changing shadows because everything stays pretty constant. If there's one thing that maybe two uh, things that you can um, suggest for artists who are struggling with their own work, what what advice can you give to them um, to make it through that hurdle? Stop trying to make a painting. Ah. The, the, biggest, the biggest hurdle that students have is trying to make a painting which and it, it all falls apart and it's not working. And the, the problem is trying to make a painting when you don't have a foundation is just not possible. It's like trying to build a cathedral when you don't know how to you don't know how to cut stone, and you don't know how to build windows, you don't know how to do arches. It's just not going to work. So don't put the pressure on yourself. Just say, I'm going to go out and I'm going to study capturing the three or four values that I see in this, this scene in front of me, this landscape. I just want to get the value of the tree, the mountain, the grass in sunlight, and, and maybe that distant field. Let's just try and just do that simple exercise. Um, or I'll go out and say, great, there's a beautiful colored building outside. And I really like the colors. Let's just try to capture the, the shadow on that wall. Let's say sometimes, um, in fact, I went out to a beautiful little fishing village close to here a few um, a couple of months ago. And the light was hitting this church. And it was a little olive tree right in front of the church throwing a shadow. And it just had this beautiful color combination. So I just sat down trying to get that color combination. So don't go out to paint a picture, go out to study something. Um, it could be um, some value relationships, it could be trying to study the composition, um, it could be trying to capture a really interesting note out of a scene. Um, you might want to study the, the shape of a tree, for example, and you know, exactly how do the branches curve on this particular tree, like this olive tree that I was talking about. And if you go out with the idea of just learning and studying one thing, it, it's quite amazing. You, you just learn the skill, and there's no pressure on yourself because you're only going to have to do a study. You're not out to do a painting, and you feel much more satisfied, and you feel like you've accomplished something at the end of it. 
Um, it just takes the pressure off. It's and an that's internal it. dialogue. Then. Yeah, and, and that's a lot of thing that I think that holds people back. So that's my advice is don't, don't try out, don't go out to do paintings, go out to study something. I think that's fabulous. I think that that's, a, that's another kernel of gold there. Well, I'll share, I'll share one thing <laughs> with you. Yes. I've actually made a lot of money out of that. Because when I take the pressure off myself and go out to do that, quite often the study turns out to be, um, you know, I've really captured something. And then all I do is put another half an hour of effort into it and I come out with a great painting. And actually, a lot of my best paintings, the small ones, have been started off as studies. And quite often, when I've gone, I said, you know, I've got to make a good painting out of this, it, it fails, it doesn't work. So it's worked for me, actually. I've um, ended up selling paintings that started off as, as little studies. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, I had, um, last year, um, I did a workshop in May, and I had various students come to um, pay, paint some. There's a lot of poppies at that time of the year in, in Tuscany. It's really beautiful. And so I had them painting some of the flowers out there. And it's actually quite difficult to paint a poppy. It's absolutely unbelievably difficult. And I'll tell you why. It's because red is one of the hardest colours to match in nature. Because it's a middle value. It's a value of five. And yet it's highly saturated. And as soon as you try to... Um, when you get light shining on it, it actually raises the value, it makes it lighter. But the saturation is still strong. But if you try to lighten a red, if you use white, it just loses saturation and gets dull. If you use yellow, it turns orange. So, big problem. So it's actually very, very difficult to paint a poppy. So I actually went out and thought, I'll try and do it myself. And so, at the end of the workshop, I started practicing doing, just trying to capture the red of the poppy against the blue-green of the poppy leaves and the green on the background. And I, I spent hours trying to get this right. And I just had a little piece of scrap paper about you know, this size. Mm -hmm. And um, after about an hour, I got the color relationship. And I did it by graying down the, the background blue-gray until the red just popped out. So I had to get the value exactly right. So after having spent all that time, I thought, wow, it looks really nice now. So why don't I just try to finish it off a little bit and, and do with a shape design? So flatten the values into three or four values to make some interesting shapes, making sure no two shapes were the same size. Mm -hmm. And then I had this little painting. So it stayed in my studio as this little painting on a piece of paper for about a year. And then last September, um, a man, actually a professional painter, came to my studio to visit. He saw that thing and said, hey, I really love that painting. Can I buy it from you? <laughs> And he, he bought it from me. It was like small one like this for like, I think it was about six or seven hundred dollars. Oh my so goodness! So there was my little exercise sketch that turned into uh, turned into a, a painting that I sold. And actually, I was quite happy with it because it really, really was nice. And to be honest, I don't do a lot of great paintings in a year. Um, I'm, I'm quite fussy with my own work, and so. I rarely get something I'm happy with, but this little one I want. It's just been an incredible interview, and, and uh, I really appreciate you. Great.